Today's reading is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Hi guys, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Raf and I help Joel lead Christchurch's East community. I live in Bow with my wife Emmy and our son Noah, and when I'm not doing things like talking to you guys, I work as an architect for a studio in East London. So basically I'm rarely anywhere that doesn't have an E postcode. That said though, we've just um, all come back from the weekend at A, and what a treat it was to see so many of you, to meet so many of you um, for the first time. I'm already looking forward to when we can be together again. Today we'll be looking at Paul's closing uh, comments to the Colossians. The letter was written to warn the Christian community in Colossae about the subtle arguments and teachings that threatened to undermine their faith. And over the past few weeks, we have covered some amazing themes and encouragements. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project kind of summarises the main thrust of the letter to the Colossians like this. No part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be reimagined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. That is what the letter to the Colossians is all about. Now, how does one end a letter that has so many important ideas? Any of us who have written anything at all, which I expect is probably most of us, whether that's a talk or an essay or even just a text, we all know that often the ending can be the hardest bit to write. Paul's closing comments, though, are not filler, but meaningful instructions that underpin what we've been hearing over the past few weeks. He essentially ends his letter with an instruction to pray and an instruction to live and speak with purpose for the sake of others finding faith in Jesus. And as we reflect on Paul's closing comments together, friends, it's my, my deep conviction that just like the early church community in Colossae, God wants to transform each and every one of us into the kind of person that will both our lives and our voices point to the wonder and majesty of God. Personally, but also as part of a collective. That as we reflect on what Paul has to say, we would be empowered to live with purpose, to share the good news that Jesus has come, that the kingdom of God is here, that new life is available and that God is working to renew all things and we, we get to be part of the story. So as we get started, I just want to say, please trust me when I say that I am coming from this, you know, place of real humility and longing. I'm not I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to sharing my faith, but like from you know many of us that we might be watching today, I long for it and I deeply desire it. Now, I want you to think about when was the last time you introduced Jesus to someone who didn't know him or mentioned his name to someone who wouldn't call themselves a follower of Jesus? I'll be honest, when I thought about this question, I actually kind of felt quite emotional. Uh, I don't ask this question to shame any of us or inflate any egos, but I think it's just a question worth reflecting on. With all sorts of people listening today, there might be so many internal responses or reactions to this idea of talking about Jesus. Some of you might find words like evangelism or mission or even convert a bit icky. I know I do sometimes. They're words that can be loaded with all sorts of cultural baggage. Some of you, when you hear the words evangelism, might experience tension in your body or past church trauma. Some of you might find it hard to separate evangelism from thoughts of colonialism or forced monoculture. Maybe some of you have brought, a, you know, are listening with a friend today and you're like, please do not talk about this. Who knows, maybe some of you might be really excited, like, yes, come on, we do not talk about this enough. It's about time. Whenever your reaction today, whether wrestling with external pressure or fighting internal battles, I just want to say that, you know, we are truly all in this together. Don't worry. We're going to go on this journey together.
Now, the church in Colossae was, that Paul was writing to was facing cultural pressure to adopt a sort of polytheism, to see Jesus as one of many gods that their society believed in, as a sort of all roads leads to heaven approach, if you will. And whilst our blend cultural context here in London might not specifically be polytheistic, it is pluralist. And as the pastor John Mark Comer put it perfectly when he said, in the cultural worldview of you do you, it feels immoral to preach the gospel to a pluralistic culture where the highest moral value is tolerance. Never mind that everyone around us are preaching different gospels. Friends, it's the context that we are in today and it can feel so difficult to talk about Jesus and not to just talk about him, but to preach the gospel, the good news. Like I said earlier, that Jesus has come, that the kingdom of God is here, that new life is available and that God is working to renew all things. In light of this, I guess the question for us today is what does it mean to walk in wisdom and to speak with gracious seasoned words? How do we use our lives and our words to proclaim a message that is worth hearing? Well, sometimes it can be helpful to start with what it doesn't look like. And guys, you know, I'm not sure about a lot of things, but one thing I am certain about is that it doesn't look like saying nothing. Who remembers that phrase, preach the gospel at all times, use the words if necessary. Now, although the intent there is really admirable, if you're anything like me, maybe in an effort to be tactful or to show the love of Jesus through your actions, in practice, this has actually looked like not saying anything at all. Maybe it's looked like longing to hear the words, they're not like other Christians, don't worry. Or, you know, like, oh yeah, they're Christian, but don't worry, they're cool. You know, but having that with the hope that one day Jesus will magically come up in the conversation. This can often end up in a weird kind of influencer style of trying to share our faith or trying to share the gospel or with weird little product placements in your Instagram or your Instagram bio or maybe a vague verse from the Bible framed in your living room or something like that. Back in my day, it would be being dressed head to toe in Top Man, but with a you know little cross necklace or WWJD bracelet thrown into good measure just to you know spice it up. But, you know, for many of us, maybe even just looks like mumbling, you know, I'm into prayer at a party or something like that. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 15 says this. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Sobering words. If we want our friends to find faith in Jesus, we need to actually tell them. But whilst it's clear we must use words as well as our lives to preach the gospel, the manner in which we do so also matters. Sharing the gospel shouldn't be coercive or use trickery. You know, how many of us remember those kind of pamphlets where they were like a £10 note and then they had some kind of gospel message on the back of it? Or been invited to something or an event to only to find out that surprise, there's a half an hour talk at the end of it. You know, kind of whatever um, it is, some of us, I think, can read this verse and in an effort to know how we ought to answer each person, we brush up on our apologetics or our clever arguments to try and prove the existence of God. And whilst this is important to know about, to think about, this, it seems to me, rarely ever seems to bring people to Jesus, especially within our cultural context. Often I think it's because it lacks the flavour of grace that Paul talks about and also misses the deeper longing and heart behind seeking questions. It can fi frame finding faith as an intellectual endeavour rather than a relational one. Jesus said in the last week of his life, I have come to seek and save the lost. The lost is such a compassionate term. Everyone and anyone can be lost, from the intellectually elite to the poorest among us. And like a child lost in a shopping centre does not want to be given a lengthy description or a map or an app to help them find their parents, but instead desires a loving and gentle hand to take their hand in theirs and guide them there. Often our best efforts to introduce others to Jesus without any sense of relationship or love often falls flat. This idea of journeying with a person and for the long haul is something that we're not used to. We may be used to thinking about how our wider culture wants everything now and instant gratification and all of that. But even within our own church culture, 
if we're honest with ourselves. Sometimes we desperately want a quick win rather than to become a friend who journeys, a friend who points to Christ. So what does it mean to walk in wisdom and to speak with gracious, easing words? How do we use our lives and our words to proclaim a message that is worth hearing? Well, first off, by being a friend, by being in the mix. Now, what do I mean by being in the mix? Well, to borrow from the kind of the salt and seasoning metaphors, you know, don't be on the side of the plate hoping to be lightly dusted or sprinkled on there, but get in there. Don't see people as individuals to convince to have the same kind of worldview of you or to convert, but instead see them as individuals to love and to come alongside and to be present with. Be a friend. Be a friend that journeys. Paul says in verse 6 that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And I think, you know, to pull something from that is a something, you know, someone needs to be in a position where they are comfortable to ask you the big questions and B, to know how to answer someone, you first need to really listen to what they are asking. What in their life has led them to ask that question? What are they seeking? This can only happen by being in the mix, by being a friend, by being around people that aren't like you or share your faith or worldview. Look at how you spend your week, what friendships you invest in, you know, I don't want to cast any judgment on sort of street evangelism or evangelism or people handing out pamphlets on the street or things like that. You know, I really think their courage and their sense of urgency when it comes to preaching the gospel is commendable and it's inspiring. But if I can hum, you know, I can hum- humbly offer a reflection, it seems to me that kind of speaking and shouting from the sidelines, you know, doesn't actually connect with people. It's dehumanizing, and it doesn't connect with people in the same way that telling your story does. Now, to be clear, I don't think that this means not talking to strangers about Jesus. You know, Jesus himself would talk to anyone that would listen. He would teach anyone that would listen. He would draw crowds of listeners. You know, I don't think it means not approaching people that, you know, God has put on your heart. But I see it as more of a a posture thing. Seeing the God given value and unique value of each individual rather than seeing them as a person to be added or a number. A person to be loved rather than to be converted. Now, that being said, we live in a particularly transient city full of busy people. And sometimes, you know, you can be friends with someone for a long time and never get to the deep, meaningful questions. Friendship evangelism, sometimes as you know how it's called, can only go so far. And so more than just being in the mix or being a good, godly, friendly presence, my second encouragement is to live invitationally. When I think of members of this community that are just amazing examples of sharing the gospel with their friends and bringing their friends along to church, it is clear to me that they live with invitational hearts. They make the most of every opportunity with outsiders, as Paul says, by having a heart and posture of invitation, of hospitality, a very un-British openness. Like Paul says, they seek open doors to share. And when I look at these fantastic examples, it can feel like these guys were just born to do this. There's a clear gifting here. But as Paul asks his readers to pray for him in sharing the gospel, he clearly expects those he was writing to to be doing the same. Just like how Jesus came to seek and save the lost, he found us and invited us into relationship with him. And now we have the dignity of inviting others in too. Anyone who has stayed with someone for a night or for the weekend knows it would be weird to invite friends over. But if you were living with a friend, if that home became your home too, then of course you'd invite people around. And just as we have found our home in Jesus, we all get to and should live invitationally and practice hospitality. At the East service a few weeks ago, Philip Long preached brilliantly about hospitality. Jesus was often found around a table with people that by society standards he shouldn't have been with, inviting people like Zacchaeus into relationship with him. When was the last time you had someone around your table that wasn't like you? Or invited a friend to join you doing something? If you're not sure what to invite a friend to, our Alpha course or one of our supper clubs can be an amazing start. It's a brilliant place to just eat and to discuss the big questions of life. Maybe today could be an opportunity to get thinking about who you might start to invite. Now, it comes to the tough bit. You know, what do we actually say and how do we say it? Well, there are a lot of things that one could say and there are lots of schools of thoughts on this. And to be honest, it could be a whole you know, lecture series in itself. 
But for today, we're going to use the passage um, in Colossians 4 as our lens. And so with that in mind, if we think about what it means to speak words with, you know, seasoned with salt, it invokes thoughts of speaking and living distinctively with flavour. That, you know, I've never come across a meal in all my years that, you know, when salt or seasoning was added, it was not good news. And similarly, our words and what we put out into the world, our lives even, should be good news to all that we come in contact with. And it will do this by pointing to Christ, or as Paul puts it, the mystery of Christ. The dictionary defines mystery as something that is difficult to or impossible to understand or explain. And yet somehow our words and our lives can point to something that is undefinable with words, something bigger than ourselves, something that cannot be fully understood or condensed into a neat and tidy tagline. I was really challenged by this quote from the author Alan James I heard on a podcast a few weeks ago. Evangelism has been infected by the desire to package things for easy consumption. Jesus doesn't sell well except as a narcotic that will take away your, all your pain and make you intensely happy all the time. The question for the believer is how to tell the truth in faith so that what we are and what we present is both genuinely hopeful and uncompromisingly realistic. And there's a lot that can be said about what this can look like, what it can look like to point to the wonder and the mystery of Christ in a way that is honest and hopeful. But for me personally, something I have found um, helpful is to frame it and to think of it as pointing to all that is good and beautiful and true pointing all to all that is good beautiful and true it's a phrase that has been on my heart for a number of years it's even on my instagram bio that's how much it's kind of impacted me over the last couple of years i love this quote by uh, paul gold in his book on cultural apologetics now full disclosure i haven't read this book but joel has and i liked him to do all my sort of pre-reading uh, before i get to the you know to the good bits but anyway listen to this Given the reality of our postmodern Athens, we discern at least three universal longings which can, following Paul, serve as starting points for building bridges to the gospel. The philosopher Peter Kreeft speaks of the three longings of the human soul, truth, goodness and beauty, and three prophets or guides or capacities of the human soul, reason, conscience and the imagination. Each of these prophets can point to Jesus, the source of our longings for truth, beauty and goodness are as revealed in the gospel. As revealed in the gospel. The gospel is the ultimate blend of goodness and beauty and truth. And I find when I'm about to say something or maybe post um, something online, a helpful question can be, does what I'm saying point to or do one of these three things? Does it point to all that is good and the source of all good things? Does it point to the beauty created by and reflected by the master artist? Does it speak the truth? Does it help dismantle lies? Does it, as Paul writes, help declare the mystery of Jesus Christ? You know, sometimes it's not that deep and you just want to post a funny meme or, you know, make a funny comment, of course, that's fine. But, you know, if it does the opposite of these things, that's something to worth consider about. It's worth considering. And this isn't just a word thing, but it's also a life thing. How we act, the decisions we make, how we spend our time and our money, when we invest, our, where we invest our emotional energy, does it point to the good, the beautiful and the true? Does it point to the gospel? So Christ Church, my encouragement is to be in the mix, to live invitationally, to use the words in your lives to point to Jesus. And my final encouragement is to spend time with Jesus. Now, this doesn't directly link to what Paul was saying here, but I believe that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we want to speak grace filled words, we must first receive grace. Francis of Assisi once wrote, the preacher must first draw from secret prayers what he will later pour out in holy sermons. He must first grow hot within before he speaks words that are in themselves cold. Similarly, if we don't spend time with Jesus or spend more time talking about him than actually being with him, we are in danger of our words lacking grace, lacking flavour. We don't want to be a person that talks about Jesus but never talks to Jesus. And this is why Paul's earlier call to prayer in the verse that we read is so important. We are to preach the gospel with grace. His instruction is to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, in a lot of Paul's letters, time and time again, 
He encourages us to remain steadfast in prayer or to pray in the spirit at all times or to pray without ceasing. You get the picture. Now, it might practically look different for each one of us. Um, but one thing I'm convinced of is that Paul's emphasis is not solely on the, like, the quantity and the frequency of our prayers in whatever shape or style they may take, but rather on the depth and quality of relationship it creates and the power of God to transform our hearts. The church in Colossus have faced enormous cultural pressure to compromise. And something it would appear that Paul was well aware of is that even the most poignant and persuasive and powerful letters and talks are not enough to make lasting change. They're not ultimately enough to keep our courage and to keep us from compromise. Everything you hear from me today, however rubbish or amazing it might be, is not enough to make lasting change in any of our lives. Our willpower and to be honest, our memory even isn't you know, anywhere close to being enough. And that's why Paul's encouragement to the church then and for us here today is to remain in prayer and to spend time with Jesus. Ronald Rollheiser writes, Our adult years are a marathon, not a sprint. And so it's difficult to sustain graciousness, generosity and patience through the tiredness, trials and temptations that beset us through those years. All on our own, relying on our willpower alone, we too often fatigue, get worn down and compromise both our maturity and our discipleship. We need help from beyond, from somewhere even beyond the human supports that help bolster us. We need God's help, strength from something beyond what is human. We need prayer. If we want to be a people that share the gospel, we need Jesus' transforming power. We need to pray, we need to pray. Even if our desire is to, as we've heard today, to be like Jesus to our friends and to live with open invitational hearts and to speak with grace and to point to all that is good and beautiful and true. But if we lack courage, maybe we need to spend some time with Jesus. We see time and time again in the scriptures that after people had an encounter with Jesus, they went away changed, but also full of courage and excitement to tell others about him, about what they had done, about what they experienced. If you're listening here today and, and are thinking that, you know, you want to tell people about Jesus, but you don't feel able to, maybe you need an encounter with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, Wherever we are, listen to this right now, Father, we do fill us with a sense of your presence. Jesus, we long to encounter you. Would you enter the room? Would you be with us now, Father? Would you fill our hearts with courage, God? Would you fill our hearts with love? A love overflowing. A love that is unlike anything we can encounter in of our kind of day-to-day -day normal lives. I love that it's only possible because it comes from you. God, would you help us? Would you empower us to speak your name, Jesus, to our friends, to our families, to our work colleagues? Would you transform us from the inside out? Would the words we speak be full of grace? will be full of the flavour of your goodness. Would you help us to point to all that is beautiful and true in this world? Would, we help, would you help us to point to the mystery of Christ, to the undefinable? Father, we pray that you would come in power. Rest on us, we pray. We know that as we speak and as we share the gospel, we don't do so alone, but we do so hand in hand with you. Be with us this week, we pray. Amen.